Baptist. My name is Logan Loveday, pastor here now. This is week two. So far, things are going great because I'm still here. Amen. Uh, we're still here, and so it's glad to see each and every one of you guys this morning. If you're new, I'm so glad to see you and get to chat with you today before, after the service. But if you are new, there's a couple things that you could do for us. One of the ways we want to get to know you is either you can fill out this little welcome card, connect card right there in the pew in front of you. Uh, you just want to fill that out, and you can put it on the table right there in the back next to the offering. Uh, we would love to get to know you, answer any questions you may have. For those of you that have prayer requests, you can write that on the back of those cards as well. Uh, we'll put those in the back, and we'll also have those on the screen if those are things that you'd like to share, and uh, we can pray over them together as a church. Uh, if you're watching online, Facebook, YouTube, or the service later this week on our local station, uh, you can text the word online to the number that you'll see on the screen. If you want to do that here as well, just easier for you, you can do that as well. Text the number, and you'll have an online connect card, basically, and we'll can get connected with you that way. Uh, myself and the deacons would love to get to know you. The rest of the church would love to get to know you. And so we're excited to be together today. Again, for another Sunday this morning, we're going to be journeying through the book of Luke again today. We're going to talk about losing kids. It's just a part of the sermon. So for any of you who said, yep, I've done that, some of you are already laughing because you know you've done that and you remember that. So it's good that we're together this morning, excited to be together. I'm going to have Jimmy open us up in scripture. And then they're going to lead us in song, and we're going to continue through prayer and the other elements today. Jimmy, go ahead. Good morning. The reading this morning is Psalm 1, 1 through 6. Blessed is the one who does not walk in steps with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and, his, and who on his uh, every day and every night on the law. The person uh, is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. By the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here in the house of the Lord, and um, it's great to see each and every one of you. We're going to worship our God today. And um, I'm going to ask you to uh, rise as we open up in a word of prayer, and then we're going to give our uh, praises to our God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for uh, your goodness, your faithfulness. We thank you that you have gathered us all here today, Father God. And we pray, Father, that um, as we are going to lift up our voices, Lord, uh, I pray that you will... Uh, receive that as a sweet-smelling aroma, Father God. And I pray, Father God, that as we sing these songs, Lord, that declares who you are, declares your kindness, your goodness, your love, your grace towards us. Um, I pray, Father, that that will increase our faith uh, to you, Father. And Lord, bless uh, every part of this worship service, Father God. May we rejoice, Lord, while we're singing. And Lord, uh, uh, fill our hearts with gladness, Father God. And we thank you for today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you guys ready to worship? Amen. Who breaks the power? Stronger, the King of Glory, the 
God's grace, right? We can hear, be here and worship Him. Consider all the worlds thy hands have 
so much for allowing us to uh, sing praises to you. Um, Father, as we are going to uh, study your word, prepare our hearts to be with uh, Pastor Logan, Father. And I pray that you anoint him to use your words, Father God, uh, to speak to us and use him mightily as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The kids will be dismissed. You may now be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see you all. We got some new faces today again. Um, just want to mention something about our first concern. I texted Donna Kirk, um, Pastor Kirk's wife, uh, yesterday. Um, her text back was short and without any details, which kind of concerns me. Um, she said that Richard is still in the hospital. procedure, lumbar puncture, and so it doesn't sound like he's doing any better, and she said that she fell getting in and out of the ambulance um, that was taking Richard somewhere, so the brevity and the lack of details made me worry about them a little bit more than usual. We want to continue to pray for them. Uh, let us pray. Father, continued prayers for uh, Richard and Donna, uh, that he would um, be able to get the procedures he needs to get better. Uh, pray for Donna uh, for injuring her leg. Uh, that would get well, and for comfort and guidance for her. Um, pray for uh, Ed Bushy, who is continuing radiation treatments. Um, be with... Uh, all the others we've been praying about with cancer and COVID issues and other health issues. Um, lift up all the people in our hearts and minds uh, that they would get the uh, health care and uh, needs and guidance they want. Be with uh, uh, our church, uh, guide us and lead us, uh, especially be with Logan and the leadership as we uh, lead your church. Help us to uh, work together to um, spread your word, however that's possible. Help us to work together to um, bring all our people together, uh, use our strengths and uh, new ideas to uh, grow your church. Be with the country, uh, be with all the people who've been affected by hurricanes and floods and wildfires. Um, bless those people, help them to get the care and the support they need. Um, be with uh, the country, or as we remember 9-11. Um, help us to remember um, all the good things about this country um, and love and support one another and work through all the issues. Um, guide us and lead us. Um, thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for your love. Thank you for sending your son. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Rod. Good morning again, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for that. I hope you guys are ready to talk back. I'm going to have some questions back and forth during the message today. So are you guys ready to talk back? Yes. yes. Good, good, good. Uh, let me ask you guys a question. How many of you have kids? Okay. All right. Now, for the rest of you, how many of you have taught someone else about the Bible or Jesus at some point? Someone else would maybe be a spiritual child under you. All right. Okay, so we can, almost everybody raise their hands in here. So we're going to talk about a couple different things today in Luke. But if you go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 2, we're going to be in verse 21 through 52. Now I say, wait a minute, Pastor Logan, that's a lot of verses. That's more than six. Does that mean we're going to be here a really long time? It does not mean that you're going to be here a really long time. We'll be here as long as the Lord leads, but we're going to look at these because we're going to look at the narrative and the different pieces that are going on in Scripture. So I mentioned earlier in the service today you know, about losing children. 
Uh, Some of you may be familiar with this passage, and a part of this is where Jesus gets separated, Mary and Joseph lost Jesus in the temple, and they find him there uh, learning and growing and teaching and having questions and discussion. And uh, so if you can relate to that a little bit, you don't have to raise your hand, but if you've ever lost someone or lost a a child, uh, you know, you've left them at home, or both of you drove cars, and I one time was left at church as well. Um, my mother thought I was with my father, and my father thought I was with my mother, and the reality was I wasn't where I was supposed to be. Um, and so I got left behind, but some family friends took me home, and that was before cell phones. I didn't have a cell phone. My, my dad had a pager, and so we paged him, but oh well. So if you can relate to that, you can kind of understand this. But then there are other pieces in this message that I hope others of us who are not parents, who don't have kids, can relate to as well. When we hear things in our world today about, I want my children to have the best, or I want to give them the best opportunities, or, or I want them to have better things than what I had, we, we tend to think that that's like the goal as parents, is we come in on street scene and we say, you know what, I want to try to give them more opportunities, or I want to work more and, and be able to make more money and so that they have more things or have better opportunities. And, and sometimes that, that actually isn't helpful because we end up spending less time with our families than we should. And, And the reality is Luke is going to show us here some very important things in these three scenes about what kids, about what others growing really need. Giving people God will make them the best. We grow in wisdom and favor as we are grounded in godliness. If you're looking for something, say, you know, what's the main point of what you're going to say today? What's the main point of this text? We grow in wisdom and favor as we are surrounded by godliness. Luke shows us what that looks like in this text, about obedience, about knowing God, about a real faith, a faith that's passed down, a faith that's a part of the faith family, and how that just grows children, grows others that are looking to grow in faith in the responsibility and owning it themselves. You know, the Gospels don't teach us very much about Jesus as a child. As a matter of fact, the most we get is really here in Luke chapter 1 and chapter 2. And we're going to see these three scenes, but they give us three factors that we all really need to understand as we look at what it means to be a parent, as we look at what it means to grow in our relationship with Christ, as we look at what it means to help others grow in their relationship as well. So I'm not going to have you stand today because we're going to look at these different verses, but we're going to start in verse uh, 21 of chapter 2 and read these first verses. Verse 21 says, When the eighth days were completed for his circumcision, he was named Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived. And when the days of their purification according to the law of Moses were finished, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Just as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there's some really interesting things in here as we look at this, but if you're looking for, hey Logan, what's the point of this one? Righteous people make right examples. We're going to see that in a minute with another person named Simeon and another gal named Anna, but we're going to look right here at Mary and Joseph and what's going on. We first see that when the eight days were completed, his circumcision, he was named Jesus, a name given by the angel before he was conceived. Now you say, Pastor Logan, why is that in there? That's just some narrative information. It's not really important to the story. Have you ever watched a movie, I know some of you that I have a relationship with like to watch sci-fi movies sometimes where they just put you in the middle and you feel like you've missed the whole beginning of the story. You just miss different details. These things are in scripture for a reason. There's a reason why Luke includes in here that he was named Jesus, a name given by the angels before he was conceived. We all need righteous examples. You say, Pastor Logan, well, well, how does this play into effect here? Jesus had righteous examples. He had righteous parents. Mary and Joseph showed this by their obedience. Their first thing they did was name him Jesus, just like the angel told them to do. There was, uh, when Mary was told that she was going to bear the Messiah, the Savior, through her and given instructions, now we see the instructions are being obeyed. Even in the beginning, they are doing the little things. You know, it's pretty cool to think about that every time Mary and Joseph would have said the name Jesus, they would have been reminded who he was. They would have been reminded of his purpose, reminded of what the angels told them in this. And so from the very beginning, they are doing intentional little steps to make sure they are being good examples for Jesus. Because they obeyed God in naming Jesus, everything they called their son's name, every time, the name itself was a beautiful reminder 
Do we have little reminders in our lives? Do we have little things that we pass on to our children? Little things that we've passed on to others? Little obedience things. Just little things. You know, love your neighbor as yourself. Now that could be a pretty big thing, but we can have little simple acts in which we love our neighbors ourselves. Not only that, but they showed righteousness in the way they obeyed the law. As they continue down in verse 22, look at this. And when the days of their purification, according to the law of Moses, were finished, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present to him the Lord. Just as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male. Some of you may have that line right here, that verse, uh, bold. Some of you may have it underlined, but that is a reference to pull out a scripture out of the Old Testament. So right here, again, we get another picture of Mary and Joseph being righteous examples in their obedience to God with their faith, with their worship, with fulfilling the law. Straight from Leviticus chapter 12, the Mosaic law gave instructions of what was going to happen, cleanliness and purification and these different things with mothers and with children after they're born, circumcised on the eighth day, took him to Jerusalem to present him before God, offered worship that the Lord required. Now, there's something that we could miss in this and say, you know what, they're just doing all these things. It just helps put the story forward. Well, if you look at verse 24, it says, and to offer a sacrifice. Now, in, in Leviticus chapter 12 in the Old Testament, when you get to this section about the things that they did, the religious rituals, they were supposed to offer a clean male lamb. But if they couldn't afford that, then they could offer two turtle doves or two young pigeons. So there's something that we don't want to miss in the fact that Jesus was born into poverty. I think we understand that as he comes and they're looking for somewhere to live and the whole birth narrative of how hum uh, humble it was as Christ coming as God to the world, not coming as a king, not coming as everyone expected him to show up, but coming very humble, coming very simple. And here we get this idea that he's coming in poverty. Poverty doesn't excuse us. It's not shameful. It's not because of some sin in our lives. The reality is here that we get Jesus coming in poverty and we get his parents being good examples in that. They didn't say, oh, I, I didn't, we don't have enough or, or God, we, we, we can't give anything at all. Or, or you know, they, they gave what they had in obedience to God. A lot of times we think it's about us giving our kids and giving others and being grand, generous and making a lot of things. But even in poverty... We can make huge differences in the lives of our children and in others because we need to model faithful obedience. You know, the good Samaritan, he could have went on the road and said, you know what, ah, I'm struggling. So I'm coming by the thief, I'm coming by the man that was beaten by the thieves. I'm, I'm kind of struggling myself and, and ah, he's just, you know, we're just going to let him be there. I'm going to take care of myself. Are, are we being faithful in these little things and modeling them for other people? Luke gives us these pieces in the story of Jesus to show us, yes, the story of Christ and how he came, but also how we, in this same story, learn how to grow like Christ in wisdom and in favor with others. We need model examples. We need righteous examples. See, parents, leaders, Christians, we all have a huge influence over children, over others that want to grow in the faith, over others who may not know as much or may not have as much church experience. We all have some kind of influence we can pass on. The question for us is, how are we shaping others? When it comes to our children, when it comes to those around us in the church, at our work, how are we shaping others? Are we doing it intentionally? Are we doing it kind of just guessing, well, if I get this right, you know, maybe I'll hit the target. <laughs> if I just try just a little bit, maybe I'll hit the target. Or being intentional with what we do. As examples, we've got to understand that the influence that we have over people, people are always watching. Right? Has your children ever seen you do something, they've repeated it or done it, and you're like, huh, I guess they really were watching. Anybody have that? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Anybody have that with a bad experience where you did something you weren't supposed to or said something? Yeah, some of you are really nodding your head, bulletins up over your face. Uh huh. We, we maybe have all been there and done that, but we have great influence because people are always watching. In the faith, are we helping other people grow? As parents, are we helping them to see their need for Christ? Are we helping them to grow to be responsible in their obedience to their Heavenly Father? Can I give you some good news today for those of you who have failed? Anybody ever failed as a parent? Anybody ever failed as a, as a person? Can I, yeah, we can be, I'll be honest. Come on. Anybody ever failed? Let me leave it right there. Has anybody failed? Okay, I'll put two hands up. All right. Good news is Christ treats us with grace. God gives us grace. Whether you're a parent, 
whether you're a mom, dad, aunt, uncle, whether you're someone else in the church or discipling someone else and you've missed an opportunity, wherever we've failed, God gives grace. If you're still breathing today, you have an opportunity to work on that, an opportunity to repent and turn from that mistake, that failure, opportunity to try again. God gives us that strength and we can rely on that. Well, the first thing we see is that uh, righteous people make right examples. But the second thing we're going to see here is that revealed purpose comes by right prophecy. So let's look at verse 25 through 40 here. Now we're going to kind of skim this a little bit, and I'll give you the highlights of it. But revealed purposes come by right prophecy. So here we have two, uh, two characters. We have Simeon and we have Anna. And Simeon, he was dedicated to obeying God's word. He was also full of faith, and he was waiting for God to fulfill his promise to send a Savior, to send the Messiah, the rescue. And, and we see that from Isaiah 41 when we get that promise in the Old Testament that a Savior is going to come to, to make right what sin and we have destroyed. And he believed God's promise. He held to it. He was given a promise himself that he wouldn't die until he saw the Messiah. He was filled with the Holy Spirit that was actually rare in those days. But he is holding on to this promise. And so you have this man in verse 25 in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. When his parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, and said, now hang on just a minute. I don't know about you as parents, if you've ever went somewhere and someone just grabs your child out of your hands. That's not the most uh, comforting feeling, right? Just to grab your child out of your hands. And here they are coming into church. And, and that can be difficult and awkward sometimes, going to a new place and trying new things. And, and so here you have Simeon. He just grabs him, takes him from Mary and Joseph, prays God and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people in Israel. Now, I love what it says in, in verse, uh, uh, later down here when it talks about um, in verse 38, um, verse 36 through 38. At that very moment, she came up and began to thank God, talking about Anna, speak about who are always looking forward to redemption in Jerusalem. And when they completed everything in verse 39, according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town in Nazareth. So you have these different things going on. You have Anna showing up to the scene. Well, she's a, a picture of really devotion of godliness. She's a, a kind of a rather elderly woman, but a prophetess, which was not uh, unusual from the Old Testament. Any time that we would see that uh, happen in the Old Testament, she was not called to lead Israel in worship. That was done for the male priests, but she was uh, giving a word from God, the exact scripture or word that he wanted them to say. Uh, and so she was well along in years, Scripture says. As a matter of fact, for 84 years, she lived as a single woman following the death of her husband. Um, she, for a long time, is serving God. For a long time, is being faithful. For a long time, is serving in the church. And so you have Simeon, who is now, he's got that promise. He's seen the Messiah. He grabbed up that baby in front of Mary and Joseph right there and said, Hey, now I can die, God. You can take me home. As interesting as that dynamic was and... And then you have Anna who shows up here and indeed, she says, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be oppressed. Okay, We have here, again, she knows this is Christ, this is the Savior, this is the rescue. We have these two people speaking over Jesus. You know, our words convey very, very powerful meaning to everyone. The reality is for everyone, whether, whether it's someone we love, someone we don't know, whether it's a, a child or whether whoever it may be, someone at work, our words convey so much power. Here we have these two examples of both faithfulness, obedience. They're going through life counting on God's blessing and trusting in his hope and trusting in his promises. And now they're going to speak these things. They're going to remind, they're going to reveal the purpose of Christ Mary and Joseph sees this. Jesus, as an infant, is going to be spoken over. And so we have these characters passing on this purpose. When we think back of, of, of Mary and Joseph uh, naming Jesus and fulfilling what the promises and the, the prophecy of the angel and passing down these things, when we see here in verse 40 that the boy grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. When we see these things and look at Anna and Simeon and these godly examples, 
we've got to remember that our words, not just our example, carry so much weight. That are we speaking purpose? Are we speaking truth over people's life? Are we giving them the good news of Jesus? Are we telling them uh, about the answers of the world and, and helping them shape their worldview and understanding in light of a creator and creation? Are we helping them grow in wisdom, whether they're our own children, whether there's someone else in the church looking to grow in faith, whether it's someone just exploring their journey with Christ? Are we helping them to grow and mature? You know, the reality is Jesus was the only one that was going to be the Messiah. That was the only spoken thing over him. We knew that he was going to be the Messiah, and he's the only Savior. None of us and none of our kids are going to be the Savior, no matter how perfect they are. Amen. All of our kids are perfect, right? Just 100% of the time. Their purpose, our purpose, is to have a relationship with Christ. To be restored to God through what Christ did. That's our purpose. Are we speaking that over other people? You know, we know that children, they grow up when they have a better understanding of God and their surroundings and their world. And when they're given an understanding of even a general sense of creation and the created order and answering these important questions. You know, in verse 33, I love what it says. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. You know, we have Simeon and Anna here speaking over and, and, and giving these words and these reminders, these purposes and Mary and Joseph were amazed, and it almost mirrors Mary when, when she gets, uh, the angel comes and with these different encounters, and she pondered all these things in her heart. Are we helping to, uh, children, are we helping others to see and know who Christ is? You know, it's a beautiful thing to let someone else know that God made them, God loves them, God designed them, God has a purpose for them. As parents, there's nothing better that you could tell your children than that God loves them. God cares for them, wants to know him, gives them grace, gives them mercy, created them, made them. You know, the responsibility for us is that as parents, we've been given these children to shepherd to Christ. As individuals in a church, we've been given the responsibility of each other to hold each other accountable, to encourage one another, to help others that don't have a relationship with Christ or, or that are new or that are, have questions. We all get to shepherd each other and grow in our relationship with Christ. That's the responsibility of us. Are we going to be those kinds of examples? Are we going to speak those things over their life? We all need to give the gift of the gospel to our children, to our neighbors, to those sitting next to us in our seat, to those at home, on social media, at our jobs, wherever it may be. And can I show you something really important that Luke wants to make sure that we understand? We need elderly. He gives us Anna and Simeon. He says, these have been faithful, obedient people. They have continued. They're going to keep continuing. They're going to keep speaking life. They're going to keep being an example over someone else. And we get this emphasis of Anna. We, women are needed. Each and every one of us, you've heard the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child, right? It takes a church to raise Christians. It takes a church to reach people, to minister, to make a difference in our community, in our city by really loving on people, showing them the good news of Christ, proclaiming the good news of Christ. Everyone needs someone speaking over their life. The good news of Jesus, the gospel, restoration and hope. See, Jesus had righteous parents and examples constantly giving him this purpose, constantly speaking these things over his life. We need those same things. We need to be those same things. And then finally, the third thing is responsible people reproduce responsible people. I mean, you get that. Responsible people reproduce responsible people. You know, we get this clear as day here and in this encounter. You know, we have this emphasis usually that, oh, Mary, he, she lost Jesus. Mary and Joseph, what bad parents were they? They lost Jesus. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story so you understand that we're all on the same playing field because I know that probably all of us have uh, misplaced our children in the house or at church or somewhere before. Uh, I, when I was a youth pastor many years ago, uh, I think it was our first opportunity to serve. Uh, we had taken a bunch of children to this uh, outreach event at another church where they were going through some different pieces of scripture in the Bible, and it was kind of an, a drama. They'd walk through the different scenes of the drama, and at the end, the gospel would be presented as it had been given throughout the whole drama. And so we had 30, 40 kids with us, and there's all different leaders, and, and uh, it was kind of chaotic. The, the group there that was organizing in the event, they weren't at the best at some of the details and some of the things. And so after all of us went through the event and 
we had some that talked to counselors and things. We, we all returned back to our church that night, and uh, I get a call that I've left a child behind. And I get this call. Now, the good news about this call was that this child was left behind uh, old enough, they were a teenager, they were old enough, but they were meeting with a counselor and she was giving her life to Christ. And so that kind of made things a little bit nicer, but there's times, I'm sure, when all of us have maybe just misplaced something or someone and we've missed it. And, you know, the reality is it's how we respond to those things that make a real difference. Because we're not perfect, right? Any, anybody perfect? Anybody want to go ahead and say they are today? No? You are smiling. I think some of you realize that we're not as perfect as we think. Here we have the story of Mary and Joseph here. Every year in verse 41, he says this, every year his parents travel to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. The first piece of their responsibility is that they have brought Jesus to church. Every year they're going and over and over, making this trek, making this journey. They understand the responsibility of helping Jesus grow in, verse 40 says, wisdom and God's grace with favor with all, as it says down later in the passage. They understand. They have a responsibility to shepherd their child to Christ. Are we inviting others to church? Are we making sure that church is a priority? That it's not just an afterthought? That gathering together, whether it's Sunday morning, whether it's for a Bible study during the week, whatever it may be, are we making our relationship with God a priority so that our children see that? Are we making our, our scripture reading, our prayer time a priority so that our children know that? Because, you know, children, sure, they pick up things, but they pick up the things that we do and talk about the most. And a lot of time, God and faith are not the things that we talk about the most. They're not the things that we have very good habits in sometimes. And so even here, the family has this habit of going together. When he was 12 years old, as it says in verse 42, they went up according to the custom of the festival. After those days were over, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know it. Assuming he was in the traveling party, they went a day's journey. Okay, I, I, a day. <laughs> this is already a day. <laughs> they went a day's journey, okay? Uh, they began looking for him and their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search him. Okay, th they missed him for a day here. Catch verse 46. After three days, they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers. We're going to continue on in this story. But I want you to get this in a very real and practical sense. All right? I want you to think about this. If you were a parent or, or if you were responsible as a teacher or for children or whatever, and you just lost a child for a day. Okay? You just lost your own child for a day. And some of you are giving really big eyes. And now, you know, I, maybe at first Mary and Joseph were thinking, okay, they're with other relatives here in the caravan, all of us going together, you know, as a family going and making this trek back home. And maybe he's just with some of his other cousins. Maybe he's just, you know just not right here with us. And so they, they do the responsible thing and they go and try to find their kid, make sure, all right, one, two, all right, got this one right here, you know. And then, so they're looking for Jesus. And then after three days go by, they, they returned here and they found him in the temple. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I'm not 100% sure if I left the house unlocked that Elliot would run down here to church. She might, my little one. Um, she also might run to Dairy Queen first because that's right around the corner. Um, but, you know, Jesus, 12 years old here, is in the church. And there's some important things that we're going to see about this. But as Mary and Joseph are doing the responsible thing, you know, we're, we could be quick and really easy to say, how could Mary and Joseph le lose Jesus? Ah, that's so important. They, they lost the Messiah, you know. And I'm sure Mary and Joseph in their own heart, we, we lost the Messiah. <laughs> we lost him. And so... Thinking about that, the reality that Luke gives us here is that they are very much very real. They are human parents, just like each and every one of us. They make mistakes. Again, that message of the good news of Jesus of when there is failure, God still gives grace. God gives us opportunity to respond is even still present here. And so we look at this and we think about this for three days and we think about, you know, they had responsible parents. How is their responsibility in this? Again, I said earlier that responsibility is seen, better seen, in how we respond to our failures than to our successes. It's sometimes seen better in how we respond to moments when we fail than when all things are nice and everything's okay and the car isn't breaking down and, and people aren't upset and fighting. And sometimes, if not all the time, it's modeled and passed on and given this opportunity to grow in wisdom and responsibility when we model right thinking, right acting, right speaking after our failures. So look at what it says, verse 47. And all those said, heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. 
When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, I, I can just hear it, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And Jesus, you know, 12-year-old <laughs> Jesus, okay. Why were you searching for me, he asked them. Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be about my father's house? But they did not understand what he had said to them. Now maybe some other translations say it would be about my father's business. Now there's some very important things that we've got to see and understand about what is happening here. Jesus gets it at the very core of everything. For 12 years now, after seeing his parents and other examples live godly lives before him, make sure that church, make sure that God was understood and was a priority, was taught and understand those things, they went together, understood that he, who he was and his purpose, understood what God's scripture, their word at the time that they had had. When Jesus had soaked up and absorbed all those things, at 12 years old, he gets it. And he understands his purpose is not to goof off. His purpose is not to, to just live the best sports career that he can have. His, his purpose is not to, you know, be the most famous. His purpose is to be with God's people, God's house, to grow an understanding of who he is in light of God, to grow and to teach that understanding to others. I, I, again, look at this. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for them. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. Jesus had got it. It moved beyond just ritual for him. He began to own his own faith. You know, that should be a goal for every one of us as parents, as Christians. When we're working with other people, we want them to own their own faith. We want them to not think about it as some ritual that we do or, or some duty that we do, but we want them to have our own relationship with God. And here we see already Jesus gets it even at 12 years old because of his responsible parents, because of the examples, because people were speaking over him. He understood even at 12 his identity and who he could be. You know, I had a youth ministry professor who used to tell me all the time that, you know, so long in the church we wait to teach people theology and help them understand the, the bigger pieces of scripture all together until they're older. When in reality we're teaching kids algebra, some of them poorly, anybody not do well in algebra, uh, chemistry in school. We're, we're teaching things that, that they can understand and so why do we wait so long to teach and model and help other people know the word of God and understand it and grow in that maturity Responsible parenting can give our children a higher level of responsibility. We see that here. Jesus says, you know, we sometimes think that Jesus is being a smart mouth and kind of going back. And sometimes it's the way preachers bring it up. But that's not really what's happening here at all. Jesus understood everything that had been taught to him. He wanted to know more and that's why he was there. That's why he stayed behind growing and asking questions. She says, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. He says, why are you searching for me? He asked, didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But then we have this phrase at the end that's given to us because we know that he's not being smart. We know that he is just giving his understanding. He got it. Mary and Joseph had produced a responsible boy who's growing in favor with God and with others and growing in wisdom and the faith is his own. In verse 50 it says, but they did not understand what he had said to him. But then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. So Jesus wasn't being a smart mouth and saying this. Jesus understood. This thing had been passed on. He had got it. You know, the whole thing when we see in Matthew 28, where we are to make disciples. We are basically to reproduce Christians, reproduce other people as we're growing to look like Christ. We want them to help, and we want to help them grow to look more like Christ. And so we've got to be reproducing ourselves, whether we're parents, whether we're someone that our kids are grown up, or, or whether we're someone helping at Sunday school, or, or a teacher in the church, or at work as a Christian. Are we reproducing ourselves all around? And again, in 52, it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and people. Our goal as parents, our goal as Christians, is that from every age, we got to help people grow in the faith. we got to help them own their relationship with God. Yeah, sometimes kids may say they don't want to go. Okay? My kid also says sometimes they don't want to go to the bathroom, and they go to the bathroom in their pants. We've got to be responsible parents. 
We have to help them understand. We have to help them grow. We can't just throw them out to the world, throw them out to everything that will grab at them. Satan throws all kinds of things. And, and guess what? There's really not much filters of anything anymore online, on TV. And as parents, we've got to be responsible. As Christians, we have to be responsible helping people because guess what? There are bad churches. There are bad apples. There are false teachers. And the whole New Testament, Paul talks about false teachers and false churches over and over. We have to be responsible helping people grow in Christ through God's word, with God's people, in God's house. Jesus got it. He reproduced it because his parents invested, because there were other examples, because people poured into his life. Luke gives us this, not just as a narrative for Jesus and for us to know these things, but for us to know these things, believe these things, and then walk in these things. We all have responsibility. We must be righteous. We must be responsible examples. We must reveal purpose to other people. We must speak the good news of Jesus. For him, it helped him increase in wisdom and stature and favor with God and people. Our kids need these things. Other people need to know the love of God. They need to understand who he is. They need to have faith and, and grow in it their own and explore it and ask their questions. So today and every day, let's be good faith examples. As we're growing, let's pass it on. Whether to it's our children, whether it's in our, our classes, whether it's at work, whether it's when we're at an event, let's continue to pass on Christ so that we all can grow in wisdom and stature with God and favor with man, and we can see the same impact in our lives, in our marriages, in our homes, at our work, in our cities, in our world. We try to slap money at everything else. We try to throw opportunity at everything else, and it really hasn't got us anywhere, but still disunified, still angry, still upset, still fighting. Christ is the only answer. And Luke wants to make sure that we know that and that we pass that on intentionally, even from infants on. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that it is still alive and that it still has an impact on all of us, that it truly makes a difference. That, God, you give us everything we need to know you. That you give us everything we need to be saved, to be rescued. God, I pray that we will pass on today everything that you have given us the good examples the bad examples god will teach what not to do what to do god will help people have an understanding of who you are and god will have people walk in that god i pray if there's anyone here that is searching that has questions that has doubts that's not sure about these things that this week you'll continue to work in their life through your spirit that you'll answer questions that we will be people that will be able to help answer questions that when we don't know the answer to the question, God, we will say, come with me, let's, let's look at your word. Let's get to know you. God, I pray that each and every person here today, God, if they're struggling with something in their health, struggling with something in a family, a concern, something that maybe even no one else knows about, God, that today they will offer that to you. Today, if there's someone, God, who doesn't know you, I pray today they'll say, you know what, I don't know there is, everything there is to know about church, about the Bible, but I want to know Jesus. I want to know God, and I want to be forgiven of my sin. I want to walk in a relationship and grow in that. I want to be a part of the faith family and all that that does in our lives. God, I pray that you will work in each and every person here today. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as our team comes, and then we're going to uh, sing a final song. Uh, but today, if there's something that you specifically was spoken to you through the message or, or something that just really stuck out to you, again, that card right there in your seat on the back has a prayer request form. I would love if you would just fill that out. You say, you know what, I want to know Jesus or I want to find out a little bit more about First Baptist or, or maybe there's something else that you said, Pastor Logan, and, and I just want to talk with you or one of the deacons about that. I'd love for you to fill that card out. You can leave it in the seat there today, and uh, we would love to help you along your faith journey. Try. 
You guys can have a seat. Again, thank you for being here today. I'm looking forward to speaking with you after. If it's your first time today, uh, I'd love to hang out with you right afterwards if you have a few minutes and just say, hey, get to know you, uh, answer any questions you may have, introduce myself as well. Uh, if you don't have time for that or today you just want to fill out the Connect card right there in your seat or you can text uh, online to that number on the screen and we would love to get to know you. I'll follow up with you this week. I'll even buy you breakfast one day or lunch. My treat, so you don't want to miss out on that, right? Who doesn't like free food, right? 
Uh, so we're glad to see each and every one of you today. If you want to continue to worship through offering, you can give online now on the First Baptist website, or you can give your tithes and offerings in the plate at the back on your way out. Um, and so there's just two different ways for us to be able to do that so we can continue to worship God that way through our tithes and offering. Again, in the bulletin there is some uh, information about the Bible studies that meet weekly. Uh, if you'd like to know a little bit more about those, I'd love to answer any questions you have afterwards, or you can just put it on your welcome card when you fill that out, and we'd love to get you plugged in and some of the other things here at First Baptist. We've got some things that we're going to be doing uh, different, some new things we're going to be introducing in the upcoming months, and uh, so we want you to be able to be a part of that, so make sure that we have your information. Uh, if you've been here a while and you've changed your information, we need to get that as well, so just fill out that card for us. It's another way for us to just kind of file on everything and make sure we have all the accurate information. Again, I thank you guys for being with us. I want to invite you back September uh, 26th, which is a Sunday night. Um, we're going to have a special installation service at 3 p.m. Uh, and so I'd like to invite each and every one of you to that in addition to coming back next week for our service. Uh, it's just going to be a great time together. I think there may be food. I know that some of the team have to plan some things. Uh, and so we want to get together and just celebrate all that God is doing at First Baptist that night. Uh, at 3 p.m. and we'll give you some more information for those of you who have given us your connect card info we'll make sure that you get all the details to that as well uh, i'm going to pray for us today and then again i'll be at the back if you have any questions i believe there are donuts and coffee downstairs so feel free to hang out if you have some time afterwards we'd love to get to know you a little better god thank you so much for this day thank you for the beautiful day that it is god thank you that we have the opportunity to come together to worship you to lift you up now, God, I pray that everything that we've heard today we'll take out and I will share with people that are in need, that are hurting. God, I pray that we'll encourage one another uh, in the days to come following this service. God, that everything that we say will be examples for you, will lift you up, will encourage others in their walk with you. God, thank you again that we know that we can come to you at any time and pray. God, thank you that even your son taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Have a blessed week, church.